So in this next series of videos, I'm going to be showing you how to make this big open terrain. I've been working on it for a while now, so I'm really excited to start putting these videos out. I'm so excited, in fact, that I'm showing my face. At least for the intro. This is probably the coolest thing I've ever made in Godot. Uh, all this in the background is traversable terrain, and it's infinite. Just to give you a sense of the scale, see that little cube off in the background? This is it close up. And all this generates pretty much instantly. My recording software is slowing things down a little bit, but I usually get between like 50 and 60 frames per second on my seven year old game rig. Um, so yeah, before I get into it, I just created a Patreon to help support my dreams of being a indie game dev. And uh, it's, it's totally well, boring at the moment, but I figured I'd mention it. So in this first video, video, I'll be showing you how to make what's called a clip map and how to handle collisions. This project just has a player scene. It's the same player controller from a previous video I did. It just has the extra ability to turn off gravity and move more like a god cam. There's also a folder with height and normal maps. I'll leave a link to the starter project in the description. We'll start out by adding a mesh instance with a plain mesh. For now, we'll give it a size of 32 and subdivide width and depth of 31. Next, add a shader material and create a new shader. This will have the height map, but later on we'll want to access it in other shaders and in GD script, so we'll add it as a global uniform. For now, I'm using this 32 by 32 pixel image that just has a single bump in the center. I'll also add the corresponding normal map. Now add the normal and height map uniforms in the shader along with the vertex function. We'll use the x and z values of the vertex to sample the height map to set the y value of that vertex. We'll also use them to sample the normal map in the fragment function, so we'll create a varying vec2 called texture position. This vec2 will first be set in the vertex function, and then used to sample the height map using the texture function, with height map as the first value and the texture position as the second. This returns a vec4 containing the RGBA values of the point on that texture. Since this image is grayscale, the RGB values will all be identical, so we can just use the R value. This will range from 0 to 1 depending on how light the texture is at the point sampled. We'll then set this to the Y value of the vertex. But obviously we want our terrain to have vertex heights that range from more than 0 to 1, so we'll multiply that by an amplitude value. We also want this value to be easily accessible outside of the shader, so we'll make it a global uniform as well. Now we'll use the texture position to sample the normal map in the fragment function, and set the RGB values to the normal map built in. So textures are sampled from 00, 0 to 11 1 in the shader language, the top left being 00, 0 and the bottom right being 11. 1. Values above or below this will wrap around. So on the left here is a pink circle representing a vertex position, and on the right is the corresponding texture position on the height map. The way that we're subdividing our mesh will cause its vertices to always be positioned at whole numbers on the x and z, so as is, they'll always sample the same spot on the texture. To fix this, we'll divide the x and z values by the size of the image using the texture size function. The first parameter is the texture, and the second is the LOD, which doesn't matter, so it'll just be zero. It'll return an IVEC2 containing the texture's height and width. We'll only be using square images, so either the X or Y will work, and it'll need to be converted to a float. Dividing by the size of the image makes it so there is one vertex for each pixel. Once the X or Z of the vertex hits 32, the texture position wraps back around and the height map repeats. Right now, the height map fits more or less perfectly on the plane mesh, but as you can see, this plane mesh doesn't have a bump in the center like you'd expect. The four corners are raised up. That's because the vertices range from negative 16 to positive 16. So the center vertex of the plane mesh samples the top left of the height map. That's fine for this project we're making though, I just want to explain why it looked like that. So right now each vertex in the shader is given in local space. In order for them to sample different positions on the height map as the mesh instance moves around, they need to be translated to global space. So in the vertex function, we'll create a new vec3 called world vertex, and set it to the vertex built-in plus the global position property of the mesh instance. You can find this property in the model matrix, which is the global transform of the mesh instance. It's a mat4, which is essentially an array of four vec4s, and the position property is the fourth item. Make sure to swizzle out the x, y, and z. Now replace vertex with world vertex in the texture position calculation. You can get the vertex built in to have the global position of the vertex by sending the render mode to world vertex cores, but I'm not using this because it causes the normal stack kind of strange in a way that I haven't been able to quite figure out yet, and the local vertex cores will still be useful later on. Next, we need to get this clip map to follow our player character around in game. Before we get to the code though, I'm going to add a node 3D to the main scene and name it clip map and make the mesh instance a child of it. Then I'm going to save this as a scene in a new folder called clip map. It'll make sense while I'm doing this later on. Now I'll add a script to the clip map scene. First we'll need a reference to the player character, then in the physics process function, we'll set the clip map's global position to the players. But we don't want the clip map to follow the player up and down, so we'll multiply the y value by zero. Now the clip map follows the player, but you'll notice this weird wobbly effect. This is because the following vertices aren't landed in the exact same position as the leading ones. 
Basically, the clip map should only move in increments equal to the size of its mesh's subdivisions. Each subdivision is one by one, so we'll round the player's position before sending it to the clip maps. And now the deformation effect is clean. Lastly, I'm going to increase the mesh's size to 512 and the subdivisions to 511, and add a better height map as well, then run the game. And everything is still running totally smooth. This gives you an idea of how powerful this technique can be. So, the mesh is being deformed on the GPU using shaders, and that's why it runs so fast. Unfortunately, this can't be done for collision shapes. We'll have to create a collision shape with vertices that are set in GD script using the image from the height map. Obviously, we can't set each vertice in a collision shape the size of our plane mesh, because that would really slow our game down. So we'll create a small one that follows the player's rounded position, like the clip map, and updates its vertices every time it moves to a new position. First, we'll need an easy way to sample the height map in GD script. I'll do this by creating a new script called height map in the height map folder, and make it an autoload so we can access it anywhere. Then in that script, at the top, we'll create a variable called image. This will be set to the image of the height map texture. We'll load this texture using a path retrieve from the global uniform height map value in the project settings. That way, when we change the height map, we'll only have to set it in one place. We'll grab the amplitude value like this as well. Next, create a function called get height that takes an x and z value. These will be used to sample the height map. Images are sampled in GDScript using the get pixel function. If we use x or z values that are less than zero or greater than the width or height of our image, we'll receive an error. We can use the fpause mod function to make out of range values wrap back around, using the x and z values as the first parameter and the size of the image as the second. Again, we'll just grab the r value of the pixel and multiply it by the amplitude. We also can't get pixels on a compressed image, so in the file system, click on the height map, go to its import tab, set its mode to VRAM uncompressed, then click reimport. Now into the collision shape that follows the player. This will be a scene with a collision shape 3D as its root node, and I'm going to call it collision map. It's going to be put in a folder also called collision map. Now attach a script. There is a shape called height map shape that we could use, but I notice that sometimes it behaves strangely, so I'll be using a concave polygon shape. The faces of this shape will be based off of a plane mesh called template mesh. I'm going to export this plane mesh so we can easily update its properties in the editor. I'm going to start with a size of 8x8 and subdivisions of 7. You'll want these subdivisions to be 1x1 one one in size, so always use a subdivision width and depth, one less than the plane mesh size. We're going to use the get faces function on this template mesh. This will return a packed vector 3 array of vertices needed to create a shape. Set these to an onready variable at the top called faces. Now create a function called update shape. Inside we'll iterate from 0 to the size of the faces array. Then in that loop, we'll get each vertex value from the array. Add the collision shape's global position to get that vertex's position in global space. Use its x and z values in the get height function from our height map autoload. Set the return value to the y of the local vertex and set that back into the array. We can refactor it like this. After the loop is finished, we'll call set faces on the concave polygon shape with the faces array as the argument. We'll have the collision map follow the player like the clip map, but we only need to update the collision map when it moves to a new position. So in the physics process function, I'm going to create a variable called player rounded position and set it to the rounded global position of the player with the y0. Then if the collision map's global position isn't equal to it, we'll set the collision map to that new position and then call update shape. We also need to call update shape when the scene first loads. Now we need a static body to put this collision map in, so I'll add one to the main scene, then make the collision map a child of it, and drag the player onto its player character reference. If you're wondering why I didn't just make the collision map a static body with a collision shape as its child, it's because moving an entire static body seems to be a lot slower than just moving its collision shape, and sometimes it can't keep up with the player, causing it to fall through the map. I'm going to rename the static body to Terrain and move the clip map into it as well to keep everything tidy. Now I'll turn on visible collision shapes in the debug menu and run the game. I've changed the color of the mesh to make the collision shape more noticeable, and as you can see that every time the player moves to a new 1x1 one one unit, the collision map updates but the collision map isn't lining up with the mesh properly. This is due to the height map image in GD script being sampled at each pixel, while the height map in the shader is being sampled on the border between the pixels. To fix this, we'll make the clip map shader sample directly in the center of each pixel by adding 0.5 to the vertex in the texture position calculation. Also make sure this image isn't compressed at all, under compress or detect 3D. We also don't need to update the collision map's shape every time the player moves to a new one by one unit. It can be updated only every time it moves to a new unit half the length of the collision map. To do this, instead of rounding the player's position, we'll snap it using a vector 3 with values half the size of the collision map as an argument. One last thing, you might want collision maps to follow things other than the player character, so I'm just going to rename this variable from player character to physics body. So in the next video, I'm going to show you how to have varying levels of detail on a clip map, and how to stitch the mesh along the seams between those levels of detail. I'm hoping to have that video up within a week, and uh, yeah, hopefully this was helpful and thanks for watching.